Welcome everybody. This is a video aimed at orienting new students to the College of Chemistry to one of the first courses that you're going to take in the Department of Chemistry, which is Chemistry 4A. It's general chemistry, it's for a wide range of students, and it will prepare you really well for the, for the second year and, and beyond. You'll take Chemistry 4A in the fall with Professor Zerk and Professor Zhu. In the spring, you'll take Chemistry 4B with me and another professor. I'm not sure who that's going to be yet, but they will be named later. So I'll get to see you in the spring. And what I wanted to do is introduce the, the people who are going to be teaching uh, you this material and answer some questions that often come up when students are thinking about preparing for Chemistry 4A in the fall. So my name is John Arnold. I'm a professor of chemistry. I've been here 32 years now, a long time. I'm also the undergraduate dean in the College of Chemistry. So we'll be seeing a lot of each other, I hope, in the fall. My background is I'm an inorganic chemist. I make things, or I don't make things these days. My students in the lab next door make them. And um, those, those compounds range across the periodic table from the lightest elements to some of the heaviest ones. That's me. Let me introduce um, Professor Zhu next. Yeah. So hi, I'm Chris Yu. So uh, my research, uh, well, I, I'm an associate professor here. I've been here for eight years and uh, um, mostly we've been looking at uh, microscopy, laser spectroscopy, and what we work with uh, uh, cells and with biological samples. So um, our interest mostly is uh, biophysical chemistry, which is a very interesting field that bridge several different things. Um, so I've been teaching uh, Camp 4A for about well, five years for now. And uh, uh, this is a, certainly a very challenge, could be a challenging course for many of the new students, but uh, you will also learn a lot of new things. And uh, hopefully you will enjoy uh, the lecture and also the lab sessions this year. Right. Thank you. Professor Zer. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you all here with us in Chem 4A in the fall. So uh, my name is Michael Sorsch. I'm a assistant professor here at the College of Chemistry. Um, and I will be starting out the course in the fall with you looking into quantum mechanics and quantum chemistry. Um, and this will be what we were starting with. And we'll be very excited to teach you the fundamentals of these to get you started in your studies as this is the basis for all the things you will learn afterwards throughout your undergraduate uh, studies. Uh, in my research, uh, I'm an alpha-fast spectroscopist. So I study matter on really short time scales. Specifically, we use uh, quite intense laser pulses to manipulate matter and study the transformation of matter with light. So at the core, we study light matter interaction. Uh, on the chemistry side of things, we use this tool as a tool to study like how, say, matter transforms from one phase into another, and what are the atomistic uh, scale processes that drive these transformations. And ultimately, we are studying new materials, quantum materials. We are interested in applications to solar energy conversion, solar fuel conversion, and uh, also quantum computing applications. Um, yeah, and again, welcome. Uh, we'll, we'll be really excited to have you here in the fall and uh, teach you some chemistry. Wonderful, thank you. So in the first year then, in terms of the instructors that you're going to see, you'll see physical chemistry, you'll see some sides of biology, you'll see inorganic chemistry, and this prepares you really well to go next into organic chemistry in the third semester in Chem 12. So that's our aim, is in the first three semesters or so, you'll get background in a, in a really wide range of chemistry so that that prepares you by the, your second year to start thinking about getting involved in research. So there's another course, Chemistry 96, that is taught in the third semester by Professor Ginsberg that will help orient you if you have questions about research. So with that, let's start with, um, we just have a few questions that we're going to address. The first one is, what can I do to best prepare for the class over the summer? So in the weeks over the summer, what, what can we do? Um, Michael, would you like to lead off? Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I would say that uh, it would be really good to recap calculus specifically. Um, so there, obviously, we do quantitative chemistry. So this course is about quantification of chemical processes at large. So besides the class where we will have uh, problem sets that you all will work on and solve and, and find solutions to, the quantitative part really comes in when you hit our instructional labs and do experiments where you, say, run a reaction and then quantify the products um, for just as an example. So it's really about a bit quantitative study, quantitative lab work. And so having, uh, having profound understanding of calculation and calculus is I think really important. So uh, looking through your material from high school and recapping that I think is, is, a, is a good thing to do. And you know, there's a lot of resources uh, online as well where you could like uh, there are free textbooks on introduction to calculus that you could kind of skim through and see uh, if there's anything you you may want to uh, read read up more a little about it but that's that would be my suggestion as far as preparing for the course thanks michael and, and yeah the title of the course is actually quantitative analysis so berkeley is very big on numbers uh, in more ways than one. So in chemistry, quantitation, putting numbers on things is very important. Also important to recognize Berkeley is a very big school in terms of numbers. Chem 4A is a class of about 240 to 250 students. By Berkeley standards in a first year class, that's relatively small. Chemistry 1A for comparison is over a thousand students in, in two or three sections. Chemistry 4A is taught in one section in one lecture hall, Pim and Tell Hall, and then you will have your own um, discussion sections and lab sections in groups of 28 to 30 in the labs on the second floor, and you'll do those, those experiments once a week. Um, very important because of those numbers, the size of the, uh, the whole place, um, and, and it's typical, I think, of university life in general in the US that um, you won't get instructors like Prof Professor Zersch and Professor Zhu telling you what to do all the time and, and, and controlling your learning. You'll be much more in control of your learning in the university. So it's very important that you reach out when you're having problems and you do that early. Don't wait until the exams happen and have a problem. Start thinking about what do I need early and, and to help you we have a lot of resources in the College of Chemistry. We have our own peer tutoring center. And so you should get familiar with that very, very quickly when that starts in the fall. Our peer tutors have done the exact same courses, often with the same instructors, so they know the material really well. So in addition to working with your GSI, work with the peer tutors. We also have a program called Chem Scholars, which you can apply to. That gives you an extra discussion section again, with students who've worked in the course with the material and they understand it, and they can help you, for example, if you have problems with the mathematics. So um, Professor Zersch mentioned that calculus is important. We know that many of you come in with, with not great calculus skills, so it's important that you start working on those and, and get, get familiar with them, certainly by the second semester. Um, on that on that topic, the math department here, and you can access their web pages, has some great resources to help you prepare. They're working on summer programs for their own students, and you may be able to get access to some of those modules as well. In particular, check out the lectures that are online by Professor Alexander Paulin, P-A-U-L-I-N. He has fantastic videos. Um, really, really clear, well presented, that you can access um, over the summer and, and that will help you prepare. Um, Kurt, do you have anything to add to, to yeah. that question? So, yeah, I would just add on more about the chemistry part, I guess, and uh, certainly uh, uh, try to also uh, uh, reveal your uh, fundamentals of chemistry, like how to balance an equation and so on, because those we will not really go through uh, we would assume you at least you know how to write out a chemical reaction equation, how to balance the fundamental, relatively straightforward ones, 
And they will be directly used as we calculate the energies for a chemical reaction and chemical equilibrium. But you have to know how to balance the equation, right? And also similarly, try to find out if a reaction goes on for how much you are generate how much weight of uh, so just still, still chemistry, those type of uh, uh, numbers, just those type of calculation are also very in, useful. And I would say, certainly try to find out uh, how to balance chemical equations. Those are fundamentals of chemistry that we will not cover from the start. We'll go through quickly in the first lecture, maybe just mention a few words, but not in details. So that's another thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll mention a few more specific things a, a little bit later, but um, okay, what about students who don't come from a very strong chemistry background? Maybe they've only had one semester of high school chemistry. Um, do you think that's, um, is that going to be a problem for them in, in Chem 4A, do you think? I, I think it's okay, actually. So in, in past year, there are students uh, who has learned a lot, they actually have learned most of the thing, that's fine too. But there are also students who have not learned anything really related to the course. But, but my suggestion is still at least, uh, you would need to know how to balance a chemical reaction to write the correct equation. And then uh, from there you can calculate things. So that's a fundamentals uh, that you would need to have. Uh, other things you could learn during the semester. That's my... Do you plan to use the same textbook as before? Yes. Um, I have that somewhere. I think that's right here. So this is um, Principles of Modern Chemistry. That's the eighth edition um, by Oxtoby, Gillis and Butler. So there you go. That will be the textbook that you'll use for Chem 4A and for most of Chemistry 4B as well. So um, you can probably find copies of that online, no doubt, one way or another, either as PDFs or as, uh, well, you have to buy them, um, PDFs or, or the, uh, the physical textbook itself. So, um, so we have the, it with the uh, uh, textbook store, the bookstore. So they have discounts over there. And also they will provide you with the access code for the online content that, that is useful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some of those can be very useful. Um, I mean, and there, there's also, there's also um, free textbooks online. So basically we have this course textbook that you can buy. And uh, I think there's also an ebook version that is like less expensive um, that uh, I, I think we also use a, this online platform to do the problem sets and uh, create and you turn into problem sets online and we create them through the platform. So there is, um, so basically the, the getting this textbook is, is basically mandatory for this course uh, to, to proceed. Um, if you meanwhile wanna start studying or catching up on material, there's also nice online textbooks. So one I found and, and maybe John can uh, post the link with this email, there are free online textbooks like for instance, Chemistry Atoms First 2E is a peer reviewed uh, chemistry textbook that is basically covering all the things we will cover in this class, starting out at a bit more basic level. So that could be a good resource to start into if you don't want to right away spend money on buying the textbook uh, right now, for example. So that would be a free resource that, that everyone with an internet access can, can look at. Uh, and yeah, I'm happy I'm to share the link. Fan, I'm a big fan of the free textbooks. I think textbook companies make too much money. I don't think the authors do. Um, I feel sorry for the authors, but the textbook companies make too much money. There's there's a book called Chem Libra Text. Yeah, um, this is another if you just one. do a search for free chemistry online textbook, and it's really good. And then the other amazing resource is Wikipedia. You can get 95% of the way there with Wikipedia for free. And unlike um, textbooks like this, there are mistakes in this textbook because it's written by human beings and we all make mistakes. The, the Wikipedia articles and the Chem Libra text, they get fixed a lot quicker than the textbooks do. And then the other point is this is the eighth edition. The seventh and below haven't changed that much. They've moved the problems around a little bit, but chemistry at this level hasn't changed substantially in, in a few years. And so 
if you're preparing, you can always just buy an old textbook and most of them are kind of the same. You'll, you'll, if you're just preparing, you'll, you'll get the picture. There are some specific things that you'll do in 4A where you need to refer to the eighth edition. So you will need it. But for, for another point is that you should never in, in, in any of your courses, just read one book. It's dangerous. You should read more than one book, more than one source. So use Wikipedia, use the online resources. Why? Because you get a different view of the same problem, a different voice, a different author is telling you about, say, the structure of the atom or how to solve this problem. And often hearing it from a different perspective really helps you get over any barriers to your learning. So get used to that idea that even though a book might be required in a course, it doesn't mean you shouldn't read lots of other sources and talk to people. Uh, Michael, what are some of the things that students in 4A or, or just freshmen in general struggle with when they come to university, do you think? Well, I would say, based on my experience from mentoring students during their fresh, freshman semester, it seems less that it's a specific topic, especially in 4A, it's not that, say, also, a lot of students would struggle with X. Uh, this is not not really the case. It's it's rather the college setting in general. I think that is a more struggle that students have to get accustomed to as, as fast as they can when they arrive. It is important to realize that college is different to high school and you're much more in command of your own success and the sole attendance of the class will in almost all cases not be sufficient to succeed. Um, so there's like like John already mentioned, there's a lot of extra reading you have to do um, uh, basically self-driven. Uh, for example, almost no case you will be able to solve a problem set in this course by just attending the lecture. Yeah, that is that is by intention, and the lecture really moderates the content and tries to convey the concepts and tie them together, as well as consolidate the understanding by doing chemistry demos, for example. But the nit gritty details for calculation and contrast won't necessarily be covered in detail during the class. So even if uh, if we have a dedicated course book we work with uh, and have reading assignments, there may be things you read about in the textbook that 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 we assign readings in that that you struggle to understand where, say, a certain calculation comes from or a certain model comes from. In such instances, you have to become self-sufficient in reading additional literature. Um, the good news is, like John said, there's many resources. You can always reach out, inquire about additional readings. Um, and there's also uh, a lot of resources at hand, and you should absolutely not be shy to use them, uh, especially the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring that John already mentioned is, has been extremely powerful for students who, who had a, a harder start, say. Um, and uh, getting familiar with these resources and not being shy to use them I think is, uh, is, is paramount. Um, on the other hand, college can be really a fun experience. Um, supporting each other is, is, is really important too. So um, progressing along together can be a lot of fun in, in your cohort. So I also strongly encourage you to really connect to your peer students uh, and you know, form study groups. That is something that we as instructors will not actively pursue with you. So this is really something you as a student have to engage yourself in, you have to be active. So, but you can get a lot out of this and a lot more than what the course itself offers. So I would definitely encourage that. Um, and, and maybe that's, maybe Kerr has more thoughts, but. I, I would add just, uh, yeah, I, I, I just uh, would like to concur with uh, what I think Michael said. Uh, I also mentioned that both Michael and I, in our lecture outline, we will specify which chapter to read or which part of the textbook that are directly connected to our each lecture. Because as Michael said, we cannot really go through all the details, but uh, the lectures try to point to the main concepts uh, of the uh, different uh, parts of this, the, the, the discussion. But the actual details are actually in the textbook that you do need to follow through, uh, both actually hopefully before the lecture and after the lecture. But if you don't have time, maybe after the lecture is a little bit more important. I don't stop, either way is fine, I guess but hopefully we'll read both before and after the lecture. That might be the best way. Um, and separate from that, we also often in each lecture on the first slide would summarize some of the results from the previous lecture. So that is another 
opportunity for you to uh, take another look of what you have learned in the previous lecture and maybe go through the textbook again just to connect uh, because we try to form coherent stories between the lectures and that's a good way to say we summarize what we learned in the last one and we start the new materials after that so that's another thing that you want to think about at least those are all all great points in particular what we can do as instructors to to help you to work together is we've removed the the um, the, the negative effects of curving in classes um, we set absolute grading scales in our in our freshman classes so that you know exactly what you need to do to get an A or B or a C. That said, grades are important as an undergraduate, but they are not everything. And you need to start to learn that pretty soon. In the, in the next point, we'll talk about the broader things that happen at universities and how that prepares you to go on to, to your next career step. Yes, GPA is important, but it is not everything. And it's really important that you recognize that early on because not everybody in this course will get an A. Most of you are used to doing very well in high school. That's why you're coming to Berkeley. But the average grade in our freshman chemistry courses is around a B minus to a C plus. So not everyone's going to get A's. That's not a reason to panic um, because later on, grades generally increase as you get used to doing the, the new skills that you have to learn here. It's not the same as high school and you haven't done it before. And so it takes sometimes a while for you to get used to that. So as, as Michael said, um, working groups collaborate with each other, not you can't collaborate on the exams or, the, or turning in a problem set. That has to be your own words and your own thoughts. But preparing to do the problem set and the exams, work with as wide a group of people as you can. Don't just um, mix with people who went to the same high school or have done AP chemistry at the same level as you necessarily, because what you will learn through your time here is that if you can teach something to somebody, one, you help them, which is a good thing. Berkeley is a very, I think, kind and, and, and welcoming place. But in addition, you will do better as well. Anybody who's ever taught anything will tell you that they learn the material better when they teach it to somebody. That's when you really, really learn it. It's certainly true from my perspective. Um, so teach it to somebody else. If, there's, if one of your classmates is struggling with the work, get together with them and, and work on problem sets and talk after the lecture. Um, also, another point that came up is that a lot of the learning happens outside of the classroom. Don't expect to be able to just watch the lecture or go to the lecture and instantly know everything. If you can, well, that's fantastic, but most students don't do that. You have to spend hours outside of the lecture doing the problem sets, reading the material that was assigned, but also much wider. Look in other books, look in the index, look on Google, Google those uh, keywords and see what other people have to say about it. Um, let's see, Kurt, other than course material, what are, the, what are some of the other things students should be prepared for before coming to Berkeley, do you think? Uh, you mean before coming to work? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Or what should they be thinking about sort of more broadly about their time here at Berkeley? Is there anything they could do to prepare for that or just think about it? Yeah, I, I think uh, we, we covered that a bit already, including math and fundamentals of chemistry. Uh, and also Michael uh, mentioned this is also to say, I guess a mindset might be the most important part is to say, uh, you also mentioned, John, that uh, uh, we will not be able to really, like a high school teacher, ask you to do particular things on a daily basis because that would never happen. Uh, in a lot of cases, you will be on your own and you need to have your internal drive, so to speak, to, to accomplish your goal. And the goal in here, for example, in chemistry is to try to learn and understand how the well atoms and molecule work and to generate those reactions. Um, and uh, 
yeah, you need to have an uh, interest uh, in the material and also work hard on your own time because there will not be a prefixed schedule and you need to fit into your uh, best way for you. If you are a <clears throat> morning person or an evening person, you may just try to find out what works best for your own starting style and how to uh, uh, do the preview of the material, do the review of the material after lecture and so on. So I think a lot of them, uh, uh, this is related to the time control, how to best use your time, how to manage your time, how to manage your schedule and uh, get things working. So I think those are certainly important. Uh, I was also maybe briefly mentioned the lab session because uh, we, we've been mostly talking about lectures so far. So lab is also an important part of our uh, Camp 4A. And uh, when we designed these courses, we wanted to have the lab always have some unknown, or at least when we developed this course uh, a few years ago, uh, that we want to put in an unknown for each run, meaning that uh, you will do a lot of preparation for the labs, but in the end, in the lab session, you are expected to figure out uh, an unknown number, either a concentration or an unknown element that you want to detect from your sample. So it's actually kind of fun in a sense. Uh, uh, doing, if you have seen CSI or something like that, you try to find out uh, 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 what is the, the, the target in your sample and what is the concentration. Uh, so they are fun to it, but uh, uh, you also need to prepare well to, to, to know what you are be doing. But uh, while the GSI is, uh, uh, the grad student uh, uh, instructors will help you through those processes, uh, but be prepared to have a lot of fun, I guess, in, in there. Yeah, I, I used to love doing lab. Lab was my favorite thing when I was an undergraduate. Lectures, not so much, but I, I did okay in the lectures, but the labs I really, really enjoyed, especially the unknowns. Helps you prepare for research, where that's all you do. You figure out unknowns. There aren't answers, and you have to go find them. Uh, Michael, anything from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I just want to say that I think Berkeley is extremely extremely diverse and enriching environment that uh, most likely will have a profound impact on your life. So while I would say there's not any like specific to do's outside this course, I would say that I would say you need to prepare for this coming to Berkeley. I would say you should definitely be really excited, excited about this big leap you're going to take soon and look forward for this new chapter of your life and be optimistic and positive about this. And uh, Berkeley will welcome you with open arms. There's going to be a lot of hard work, but I also encourage you to really think in the bigger perspective of how much impact this will have moving forward in your life in this new chapter. I, I agree. We, we are a university and that has a specific meaning. It means the, the material that you're exposed to here potentially is, is the universe. Um, of, of education. We are not a technical institute or a technical college. We are a, a proper university. So we encourage you to, to take courses across the whole university. We have uh, students doing majors and minors in other departments, theater, art history, physics, material science, uh, English, history, all of those things. Might be too early to think about that right now, but, but start to consider that as you move on through the program. We've talked a little bit, I think, about um, your, uh, your approach to the, to the lecture beforehand and, and afterwards. Any other pointers on study tips? I, I can sort of lead off and say that in my experience, everybody does this a different way. So I don't think there's a one size fits all policy for how you study and to get the best results. You have to kind of figure that out for yourself. Um, Kerr mentioned you might be a morning person, an evening person. You're gonna find that you have long blocks of time where you're not in class. What you do with that time is gonna be really important and everyone's going to do things differently. My advice from my perspective, um, this work for me is take good notes in class. If you have the opportunity, read, the material ahead of time. When I was an undergrad, we didn't have the chance to do that, but now in Chem 4, you do. So read whatever prep material you can, that will help you understand the lecture better. Pay attention in lecture. 
Don't be on your computer doing Facebook or whatever else it is. Uh, you're distracting yourself and you're distracting the people behind you. So don't do that. Don't be on your phone. Uh, don't be playing games in, in, in lecture. If you're going to do that, stay home or be somewhere else. Um, pay attention, focus, take really good notes. Some people can do that on a type, on a keyboard. Most people, particularly chemists, need to write things. And why should you focus on actually handwriting it? Because nearly all our exams are handwritten. And what you want to be really good at is doing really well on exams. And doing well on exams is a skill that you have to learn. Here's a question. Here's an empty box. I've got to draw something. I have to write an equation or draw structures, particularly when you get to 4B and, and Chem 12. Practice that because that is a skill. And you only get good at skills by doing them over and over again. So as much as possible, take, take handwritten notes, or if you're using a computer, um, it's hard to draw on a computer. If you have an iPad with a pencil or something like that, that works pretty well too. But take good notes and then afterwards, review them. Go over those notes and where you have questions from the lecture, like what, what, what was that? And you didn't understand it. Um, put a big question mark and afterwards talk to somebody, think about it and get an answer to that question. Don't wait until the, the exams to think, oh, I don't know what that is. Any other tips from Michael or Kurt? Yeah, yeah, I would want to mention, I think you had a great, great point. And, uh, and, and for, for this, uh, for, for, for our um, uh, format, uh, we, we will be using PowerPoint and we will be providing you actually the PowerPoint slides before the class or as PDF typically, or as just a screenshot. Uh, so what, what I would suggest you to do if you, are, uh, you want to write things is that you could print them out before the course. So before each lecture, you could already see the slides that will be presented. So you could pr print them out so that you can write on them during the lecture. Or if you prefer to use a pad, you can just download it on a pad and you can write on the pad. So I think that would be uh, certainly helpful. Uh, separate from that is also um, try to make good use of the office hours. I don't know if it's a new concept for you because in high schools, I, I guess you don't have to have office hours, but for, uh, uh, for the universities, uh, office hours are times when the professor will open uh, the office for maybe one hour or one week or sometimes more uh, so that you can come in and ask for questions. Uh, so that's another opportunity to uh, sometimes people actually come to see what other people are asking. So th those are different possibilities uh, to, to get uh, the details and whatever questions you may have, uh, try to ask them. And if you have short questions, you can also ask after the lecture, just to write off the lecture for a few minutes. Uh, that's also typical. But for the longer questions, try to come to the office hours and uh, uh, talk to us. Michael, anything anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe I would say when recalling when I was a young student, I think it is really helpful if you early on assess your own learning style and what works best for you. I stress for you. That is something, there is a lot of resources online if you Google uh, learning style assessment. Uh, there's a lot of free resources you can test yourself. And if you've never done it, it's actually quite insightful to do um, so that you early on know what works best for you uh, in a way to assess materials and learn material. Um, so when you attend your first class, you will see a lot of different approaches. And for example, some students may flip their laptop open and make notes at the rate of that they almost transcript of what the instructor is saying Others may have a tablet and just annotate slides, like I mentioned. Others may have a printout and handwrite, and like the handwriting, the mechanical process of handwriting, like the John, John pointed out, is, is, is also important. And some for some, this is really important so that they even learn the material in the first place. Uh, others may have nothing. They just uh, sit and watch and, and get it, you know. So that is that there's a few different approaches and, and, and people try different things. And I encourage you to assess yourself and see what works for you. Don't get too much overwhelmed if you're the person next to you does something else and seems to be a stellar student, say, and you struggle. It may be just that you have to find what works best for you, you know. So that is, I think, this is something that I as a student learned in, the, in my first semester. And then moving forward, I knew how I have to approach things so that I learn the material in the class the best way. 
Um, I, I, for example, I'm a visual learner, so I take notes not as densely as others. Uh, for me, it's more important to have a sketch that I annotate, for example, or write down a chemical formula and then make more sketch. And I don't normally take very dense notes for myself, but it doesn't work for everyone. So it's really important to assess it for yourself and also think about the different parts of uh, uh, taking a class. So specific for 4A, there's like three parts, right? So there's the class. That's where you see Kashu and myself. Then, then you have the lab where you do experiments and take notes on your experiments and then have to produce a lab report. Um, that is a totally different setting. And even that is also learning, even though you do experiments and it's quantitative, you learn things like how do I use a certain tool in the chemi chemistry lab? Or how do I correctly read a scale? You know, there's a lot of things you learn and then taking the right notes so that you can later recall that and say after a lab, go through it and understand this is what I did and produce a really good report because you can uh, demonstrate that you learn the skills that you're supposed to learn in, in a good manner. So, so in the lab setting, you may need a different way to take notes and, and learn the material than say if you attend a class. Uh, where you have a very condensed one hour session at a time, hearing about concepts that tie together to things that you heard about say four weeks before. So that is that is where things really get uh, get to a point where you have to see how things work for you. And then also the self-study part at home. That was for me as a student, I must say the, the most complicated part because you then uh, immerse yourself into this environment where you live, you have roommates, you, you know, maybe noises at times and figuring out for yourself, are you better off to actually try to find a, a desk in the library for a while and do your problem sets there? Or are you better off like at home and just find, you know, in, in your dorm and for example, and find a time where it's quiet and that's where you, you're the most productive or what Kaz said, morning versus evening person, you know? So these are the things I encourage you to try to be very self-reflecting in your early days here, in your first few weeks, try to find out what works for yourself. Of course, also talk to your peers and see what they do and consider trying a few things out. The earlier you get what works for you, the better you will progress. Um, so that is, I guess, my general ad advice for studying. And then the other thing, I mean, as unfortunate as it is, you start your college endeavor as a global pandemic winds down. I mean, the pandemic has changed college life and instruction considerably. For example, lectures are now largely being recorded and you can watch them in replay. That is good. So if you didn't say, if you, even if you attend a live lecture, you will most likely see it, be able to get a recording later, you can rewatch, that is great. Um, that is for 4A uh, especially true because uh, for a, at least the class will be most likely as far as we know now, be in a remote setting. So we'll teach via, we assume. Uh, while the labs will be in person. Yeah, so I would, um, and then what, what we hear sometimes is that students don't f f feel it's much more appealing to just watch the recorded lecture and then say even replay it at 1.5 1, 1. times the speed. So then it just takes, you know, half an hour to watch the whole lecture, Michael or Ke shooting away the content and, 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 and students, some students may find this appealing to, to, you know, hang out somewhere and just watch the lecture on fast rewind and that's it. Um, I would recommend to not do that. Um, there are very often very subtle notes when we in, do instruction uh, that you also don't find as a tag on your slides that you get, you know? So these are things we say, they are not in the slides, it would be notes you take. Um, so don't think of the slides to be comprehensive. You know? That is what we, we display something and talk about it. So you have to take notes and really follow this. So it also really does help to attend the live classes and I encourage all of you, even though we are on Zoom and there will be recordings, um, I really encourage to attend the live class and participate in the interactions. There will be breakout sessions. We will um, try to get also peer discussions going a little bit during class within the time that we have. And those won't be recorded um, so that you know interaction is really encouraged. So you will lose out on a lot of things if you're not planning to attend the class live be it in a remote setting. Um, so I really encourage you to take that seriously and uh, prepare yourself for a low destruction environment if you can, uh, and really um, try to take the class if you were sitting in the classroom. And that will prepare you also for, the, for, the, for, the, for what comes afterwards uh, in your studies. Um, last question, then we'll, we'll wrap up. And it, 
it speaks to the something that we've already mentioned, I think, is that not everybody comes in with the same background preparation into, into Berkeley. Some students have done a lot of chemistry already. Some have even done some research. I would say most people haven't. Some people have really good scores on AP and IB exams. Some people don't. Some people never had the chance to do AP chemistry in their high school. So don't be alarmed if when you, when you come into Berkeley, you feel like you're, you're really behind and you have a lot of catching up to do. You have time to do that. And we are, we are putting resources out there to help you catch up so long as you're willing to put the effort in to do that. So recognize what the problem is, as Michael was saying, um, figure that out as soon as you can, that I have a problem here that I need to solve. We can help you solve that problem. But if you don't recognize that, or you're not prepared to put the effort in, you will have a hard time. To that point, we, we have a, another option in addition to Chem 4A, and that's Chemistry 1A. I mentioned that earlier, it's a bigger course. It's generally taken by our non-majors, but quite a few of our majors take it too. It, it teaches roughly the same material at a slightly lower level. So the, the kind of on-ramp is a bit smoother. And what we've noticed over the last few years is that students taking 1A, so long as you do okay in 1A, uh, you can go into chemistry 4B in the spring. That transition will be harder than if you've done 4A. It's a smoother transition if you've done 4A to 4B, but it's still okay. And what we're looking for is getting you through for, uh, the first year, 4A or 1A and then 4B altogether, into then the second year into organic chemistry. And so long as you do okay in either 4A or 1A, you can go on to 4B and on to Chem 12 and everything will be okay. So I don't know if, if Kerr or Michael have any comments on 1A versus 4A and, and sort of your opinion on that. Should students consider doing 1A? And you will get some advising on this through the, through the undergraduate student services office when, when you speak with an advisor. But anything from your perspective that you want to say on that? Uh, I think 4A is more quantitative, and we also try to connect uh, a bit more behind the equations a bit more, uh, meaning in a sense, in, in one day, in certain case for certain equation, you will still learn those equations, but you will not be shown how they are derived. Uh, but in our case, in some case, we try to connect those concepts a bit better. Uh, so, so in a sense, if you are really interested in the science part of why a particular equation arise that is useful for a particular application. I think 4A is a better way to connect those concepts, but at the same time, certainly there are more math in that you are shown more of those equations. Like, for example, in my part of the thermodynamics part, we try to connect the different equilibrium equations with uh, uh, um, energy states and also yeah. those different concepts and entropy and entropy. Uh, to a more fundamental level. Uh, so it depends on if that will be really useful for you. Uh, you, you can consider that, I guess. Uh, but if just for the purpose of connecting to 4B, uh, I would imagine it, it actually indeed may be okay between 1A and 4B actually, uh, but you might be missing out on some of the fundamentals. So on the sort of deeper, deeper, deeper insights. Concept. Right, yes. Yeah, I actually find those concepts might be useful for you if you are going to be a chemical researcher, especially uh, if you are to be a faculty in chemistry, for example, you need to be able to better connect those concepts rather than just knowing those equations. So, mm -hmm. so in that sense, I think 4A is valuable. Yes. And you will see what, what you'll notice in your studies is that there tends to be a kind of a spiraling effect. You, You'll see some stuff in, in Chem 4A and 4B, and then in another year or two in the upper division courses, you're like, oh, we're doing this again. I thought we already did this. <laughs> Except now you're doing it at a deeper level and a broader level. So you're building on, on what you've learned before. So there'll be plenty of time later to revisit this in more depth. Michael, any, any comments on this point? 
No, I second all it's been said. I mean, it's really, um, you know, as I introduced earlier, I will be teaching the first section of uh, CAMP 4A, which will focus on basically the fundamentals of quantum mechanics and its application to chemistry. And um, like I mentioned, so a lot of times when, when I teach this class, you will hear me say, so now this is as far as we go in this class and say another course like a year later specific to quantum mechanics will then go in deep and introduce the map, like more of the map behind and connect to different concepts. So these are the things you will not necessarily have in 1A because 1A is, is supposed to be more like a self-sufficient course for non-majors also, they, that they get, you know, the principles of, of chemistry in and the fundamentals. Whereas in 4A, my approach to teaching this is really to get you started to go through the whole uh, the whole class, the, all the classes in chemistry, all the way to graduating uh, with a major in chemistry. And so this is how uh, we try to tie these concepts together. We'll give outlooks, we'll say, we will stop at this topic here now, but be advised that this is much more deep and it will co be covered basically, this one subsection that we cover in one week will be a whole class later on in your studies. And, and that will then later allow you to recall that. And I think if you, if you study for a major on chemistry and also want to become a researcher in, in chemistry, I think it is really important to get these, this time to get off concepts early on. And this is exactly what the textbook can do for you. That is where a textbook doesn't help you because the textbook has chapters. You can read the chapters. They are sort of interconnected too, but it doesn't give you the perspective of a whole field. It doesn't give you the perspective of a whole um, you know, subject of study like chemistry that is so complex between all the different topics you can you can evolve into. So that is where I think 4A is, is quite different than 1A. Um, maybe what, what's been said before, I want to enforce that too, is that 4A is a smaller class size. It's a bit more personal. You have more interaction possibilities with your instructors, with the GSIs possibly. Um, it's the content goes faster. It's probably going to be a little bit harder to do. Um, as far as your preparation, what you need to know to succeed or the, your preparation that you have to have to succeed in this course, I don't think it's that different, um, but it will make you work a little bit harder. On the other hand, you get more out of it. So it's really, I think it's a weighing off of these things. Yeah. And this year we're developing a summer course as part of the, the, the UC Berkeley Summer Bridge Program. So some of you might may have received a, an email invitation to join Summer Bridge. If you have, definitely consider signing up for the College of Chemistry um, course that's part of Summer Bridge because it's aimed at preparing students who, um, who, who might be concerned about starting 4A if they've only had a semester or so of chemistry or, or their high school didn't offer chemistry at a very high level. It's aimed at offering you a really good preparation to enter Chem 4A and do well. It will show you the kinds of experiments because there's a lab component where you can go in the, the Chem 4A lab and actually do some 4A experiments. And it has a lecture component too. And also you'll all be housed together in the dorms. It's an in-person class this year. It's one of the very few that we're offering so if you've had an invitation to that, definitely consider, if you can, come in the summer early and get involved in that. I think with that, our time is, is up. And uh, I'd really like to thank uh, Kurt and Michael for spending the time to do this. I think it'd be really useful for all the incoming students. So I'm very grateful that you've done it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and see you in the fall. Yeah, we'll see you all very soon, hopefully in person. Have a great summer. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.